Former CIA director and four-star general David Petraeus is a regular guest on DW News. General Petraeus, thank you very much for making time at the very beginning of this crucial year. Mr. Petraeus, besides the war in Ukraine, we are witnessing another major military conflict in Gaza. The Israeli government says its goal is to destroy Hamas and that it will continue their military operation until this is accomplished. With your experience, is this even possible to destroy a terror organization such as Hamas militarily? It's possible. The question is whether it is likely at this point, and I think it is in question. To do that, uh, as I've described to you before, you have to clear and hold all of uh, Gaza. Uh, you have to clear uh, every building, floor, room, cellar, tunnel, uh, destroy the infrastructure, kill or capture a substantial number of the actual, the leaders in particular, but also the fighters. And we're talking tens of thousands. They want to destroy Hamas, dismantle the political wing, and obviously gain the uh, the recovery of their hostages. But there need to be other big ideas. Uh, there needs to be a big idea about who's going to administer Gaza. I think inevitably, at least on a temporary basis, it's going to fall to Israel to do that. There are no hands going up to do that. There's no capable, competent, trustworthy Palestinian entity that can be brought over from the West Bank. They wouldn't want to go in on the backs of Israeli tanks anyway. Sounds as if it's transitioning to a more targeted raid approach that can indeed uh, kill or capture leaders of Gaza and perhaps important elements of it. But we used that technique in Ramadi and Fallujah and other areas uh, in Iraq prior to the surge. Um, and while it might disrupt the enemy periodically, uh, it was not enough to destroy the enemy. To destroy an enemy, you have to render it incapable of accomplishing its mission without reconstitution. The strategy uh, Israel is following right now uh, comes with a huge humanitarian cost. I'll just say, first of all, that when we conducted these operations in Ramadi, Fallujah, Bakuba, Mosul, particularly Mosul, a very large uh, city, and other parts of the urban areas in Iraq during the surge, when we destroyed Al Qaeda in Iraq, we were worked very, very hard to keep loss of innocent life to a minimum. And often the very first objective would be to seize the hospital. For example, Fallujah, the first objective was to actually take control of the hospital and keep it open and to provide our medical assistance and uh, pharmaceuticals and drugs and all the rest of this uh, if they were running short because we wanted to take, take care of the population, knew that inevitably there are civilian uh, casualties, but again, you keep them to a minimum and when they do occur, you try to treat them as quickly as you can. Again, the objective is to create a better life for the people as you are also separating them from the extremists and destroying the extremist group, which has brought such hardship on them. Mm -hmm. We also had a sign on the wall of our operation centers and every one of my five combat commands, which asked a question, will this operation take more bad guys off the street than it creates by its conduct? And if the answer to that was no, then you're supposed to go back and examine how you can change the operation so that the answer is yes. If you still can't get to yes, then you put it on hold for a period of time. But there's no question, I think, that the loss of innocent civilian life has been very troubling. And our president, vice president, secretary of state, secretary of defense, and others have uh, reiterated how crucial it is uh, that you not create additional enemies. You don't foster an, an, a new generation that might be attracted by the Hamas ideology uh, by the way you go about destroying Hamas. And again, I want to see Hamas destroyed. I want Israel to be able to achieve that. I believe it is necessary. If you don't do that, then again, what's left will reconstitute uh, and you're going to see a necessity for more such operations in the future. An Israeli drone just killed a deputy Hamas chief in Beirut. Um, that is also causing uh, uh, more trouble, if you want to say so. So Lebanon's PM accuses Israel of trying to, I quote this here, drag it, Lebanon, into a regional war. So my question is, I assume, how concerned are you that the war will be spilling over to the whole region? 
I, I think you clearly have to be concerned about the possibility of uh, widening of the war, if you will. And we can walk our way around the region, Lebanon, Iraq, uh, Iran, uh, Yemen, and so forth, and, and discuss that. When it comes to the Iranian-supported Lebanese Hezbollah, however, I've felt from the beginning and stated from the beginning that I didn't feel that Hezbollah wanted to get into the kind of war that they uh, provoked with their actions back in 2006. You know, the original assessment in that case was that the Israeli Air Force had overpromised and underdelivered. Uh, that assessment proved inaccurate. And several times in subsequent years, once when I was the Central Command Commander, again, later when I was the director of the CIA, we went back and, and changed that assessment as we realized how much damage uh, Israel had done to Hezbollah uh, infrastructure in southern Lebanon and the fact that they were still rebuilding. I'm sure there are still signs of damage from that particular war. Uh, and I think that is why they have so far been calibrating what it is they have done. They want to show that they are uh, supporting Hamas and they're doing it certainly very much rhetorically, but their physical actions have been limited to a handful or two handfuls of attacks per day that have only gone to a certain depth within Israel. And it is interesting that the Mossad leader, uh, David Barnea, has stated that this is going to be carried out in a way. He alluded to what was done after uh, the terrorist attack at the Munich Olympics, that they're going to hunt down Hamas leaders wherever they are. Some people around the world uh, say that the U.S., however, still should draw kind of a red line in regard of Israel, uh, supporting Israel with military equipment. Do you agree on that? Should there be something where the U.S. says, no, stop, that goes too far? To be fair, the administration did actually uh, halt the delivery of small arms uh, because of its publicly stated concern that they might be provided to the settlers in the West Bank who are carrying out what was essentially vigilante uh, actions in the eyes of the administration. So there has been some limit. But again, I think we all want, by the way, I think the Arab countries in the region want to see Hamas destroyed and the political wing dismantled. Again, the biggest fear of many of the Gulf states is precisely what Hamas manifests. Uh, it is political Islam uh, and it is extreme Islamist extremism. Um, so again, I'm rooting for Israel. I want them to be able to destroy Hamas and dismantle its political wing and obviously to rescue their hostages. Uh, but right now, it is not entirely clear whether that will prove possible. No situation has been more challenging than that which has faced Israel in Gaza. The density of the population, an enemy who doesn't wear uniforms, uh, an enemy who hides behind civilians, uses them as human shields, holds over 100 hostages still, has a vast tunnel network, and knows the neighborhood, has been preparing its defenses for many years, uh, in some cases is willing to blow itself up to take them with him. Uh, again, it just could not be more challenging and more complex. 2024 is also a presidential election year here in the United States. Many people around the world ask, what if Trump wins? What do you expect? Would he do with respect to Ukraine? Would he try to kind of do a switch up with Putin? Is this something possible? I honestly don't know. Keep in mind, there are many other uh, bodies in Washington, including both houses of Congress, uh, in which there are strong bipartisan majorities that support continued authorization and appropriation for Ukraine. And I think we will see in the weeks that lie ahead, for example, that the issues in our House of Representatives will be resolved. Uh, of course, what they're trying to do is use some of this as leverage to get the administration to a degree some, to some policy changes and other actions to uh, improve the security of our southern border, which I think is a, is a worthy objective, given the issues uh, that we're seeing down there, the unprecedented number of illegal uh, immigrants coming across that border. But I do think that this will be resolved. The question is, is it next week, the week after, the week after that? But there will be very substantial uh, additional authorizations and appropriations for Ukraine and also to replenish our own stockpiles. Uh, 
so that is forthcoming. That will take us all the way through uh, until the inauguration of the next uh, administration. And frankly, the 10 months that lie ahead is an eternity in American politics, as you know from being here for some time. There's no telling what twists and turns uh, may uh, may appear uh, in the months that lie ahead. And I think very premature to start speculating about what one or the other candidate will particularly, however, uh, the former president uh, might do if he were to come back to office. However, last time he was in office, he tried to really pull out of NATO. Um, I mean, you as a four star general, what do you think? What would uh, the military leadership think about that? And could they try to throw up obstacles uh, against that uh, wish? Uh, and how would they look like? Well, there's already been legislation passed that prevents a president from taking us out of NATO. So I think that's not a not a viable question at this point in time. However, NATO is built on trust. If he would tr threaten to leave NATO again, wouldn't this alone, this threat alone, weaken uh, the alliance tremendously? Well, you know, I used to say uh, when uh, President Trump was in office that you should read the tweets um, because they are they were the unedited expressions of the president of the United wow. States. Uh, but then follow the troops, follow the money and follow the policy. And actually, during his administration, we returned an armored brigade uh, to Europe uh, for the first time since it had been withdrawn some years previously, I think during the Obama administration. Um, we approved the new NATO structure uh, and so forth. Um, supported a variety of other initiatives that actually improved uh, the posture of NATO. Uh, so all of that was carried out. And again, keep in mind that there is very, very strong bipartisan support in Washington, D.C. Uh, for continued involvement with NATO, but also recognize that every single pres president, including the two for whom I served as a commander, as a four-star in war, um, were concerned uh, and expressed it publicly uh, that there were certain NATO allies who were not paying their share, if you will. And that's why it's been so heartening to see Germany, after the Zeitenwenden, uh, commit to not only getting to 1.5% of uh, GDP on defense, but to exceed 2%. And, and we look forward uh, to seeing that implemented, obviously, uh, through the Bundestag. It's very, very encouraging. The number four economy in the world that increases so substantially is a very significant statement. And I'd also just point out, finally, uh, that Europe has committed to double what the United States has committed to in supporting Ukraine. It's not only given more now, pledged more in terms of security assistance than the U.S. has pledged, and the U.S. has pledged over $44 billion, as you know. Um, it is pledged far, far more when it comes to economic, uh, financial, and humanitarian assistance, which I think is appropriate. This is, after all, a European security issue. That brings me to my question. Uh, does the U.S. has really the strategic patience to keep up uh, the support for Ukraine? I think it does, and I think we also have the capability. Um, I noted that the U.S. has contributed over $44 billion worth of security assistance, but that's out of two years of defense spending that total more than $1.7 trillion. So this is very affordable. And again, uh, Ukraine is not asking Americans or soldiers of any NATO country to fight and die for their country. Uh, their young men and women in uniform are doing that. It, this is their war of independence, and they recognize it as such as their fight for their very survival. Did Ukraine really ever have a chance to win this offensive without Western fighter jets? Uh, in hindsight, I think not. Uh, again, our own doctrine requires air superiority, not just air parity, but air superiority to breach the kind of very substantial obstacles that were encountered uh, in the defenses that Russia established in the South. There are rumors or talks uh, uh, that uh, it is possible that most of Ukraine joins NATO and the rest stays occupied by Russia. Do you think this is a possible, a likely scenario? I don't know that it's likely. I know that it's one of the kinds of scenarios that people are exploring. Um, I tend to think that 
liberating really all that Russia has occupied, including Crimea and the Donbass, is really necessary, both from a defensive perspective, to shrink the area that Russia uh, can uh, engage Ukraine over. I mean, the front now is very, very substantial. It's vastly greater than it was uh, when you just had Russia in the Donbass. But but the Donbass is also necessary from an economic perspective if you're truly to see Ukraine prosper uh, in the way that we would like. Uh, but I know there's a variety of different scenarios that people are looking at uh, that could engage uh, NATO in some way. Certainly EU membership as well would be very, very desirable. Uh, and then commitment of very substantial funds and what might be termed some kind of modern day Marshall Plan uh, to help Ukraine pursue its reconstruction. What is the biggest threat for Ukraine right now? Well, I think there are a number of possible issues. Um, the most concerning, I think, right now is the possibility that Russia could, on some evening, let's say, really overwhelm uh, the counter drone, anti air, and Uh, anti-ballistic missile defenses and do the kind of damage to Ukrainian infrastructure that it has sought to do from the very beginning, uh, but never really has achieved. Uh, and I think that could be very, very uh, damaging. It would, um, it could undermine morale as well. And it's why I said it's imperative uh, that we rush everything we can to them uh, as quickly as we can to ensure, frankly, that that is not possible. What do you make of reports of U.S. Uh, pressure on Zelensky to cut a deal with Russia to at least freeze the war along the current front lines? Not much, because I don't think that they are. Uh, I don't think there are those kinds of pressures. Mm -hmm. um, certainly, it's one thing for people to explore or think about or, you know, how might uh, this war be brought to an end. But the administration has said from the outset that we nothing with, about Ukraine without Ukraine. And, and I believe that they have adhered to that particular big idea. Where will we be in six months time? In Ukraine? Mm -hmm. It depends. Uh, and having taught economics in an earlier life, uh, you can never go wrong by beginning an answer by saying it depends. Uh, it clearly depends on a variety of the different uh, factors that I've explained are in play. Um, it depends on how well the Ukrainians do in generating additional forces. Uh, it depends on how well uh, the Western countries, NATO countries, U.S. Uh, do in providing the capabilities that General Zeluzhny has identified as being required. Uh, it depends on whether Russia can continue to generate forces on its side, noting that it has never fully mobilized. Uh, it is trying to shield the population of Moscow and St. Petersburg and so forth, and generally uh, recruiting forces from the more rural areas, uh, not to mention from prisons and private military contractors, rather than uh, from the children of the, the elite, uh, if you will. Look, I really think this is about as right versus wrong in the world that it gets. I think it's very much uh, in the interest of all NATO and all Western countries uh, to make sure that Russia cannot succeed uh, and that Ukraine is able to liberate all of its territory, join the EU, join NATO, uh, and enable uh, its reconstruction. Thank you. Pleasure.